This is episode number 64 of the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome back to the show. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile care by promoting high-level, creative husbandry, individualized for each animal. As always, if you are looking for more information on the podcast, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you'll find show notes for both my show, Animals at Home, as well as Bryce Broom's show, Animals Everywhere. And if you are looking to support the podcast, there are two main ways you can do that. The first is give us a five-star rating on the Apple Podcasting app. So if you use the Apple Podcasting app, five-star ratings do go a really long way. And if you are, of course, welcome to write a review as well, if you like. And the second thing is share the content. Share it on social media, share it on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Share it with the reptile community. We are slowly growing the show and finding the show on more reptile keepers ears. And that's the goal we want to continue to expand. So any way you can help us do that is great appreciated. And as always, thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com, our show's sponsor. You can find affiliate links in both the show notes as well as the YouTube description. And of course, if you do end up purchasing something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. All right, let's jump into today's episode. So this was a very special episode for me because it is the first time I have recorded an episode with a guest in person. So I started the podcast in the fall of 2018 and recorded over 60 episodes at this point. And all of them up until this point have been recorded on Zoom on the computer. And finally, I had a guest live in my little reptile room slash studio. So joining me on the podcast today is Steve Rempel. Steve is definitely the reptile guy or the go-to source for reptile information in our province. And for those of you that don't know, I live in Manitoba, which is a province in Canada. And I've said many times that it's a relatively small community when it comes to reptiles. We don't have a whole bunch of different amazing reptile pet stores to choose from. There's only a few smaller ones. We don't have these massive expos that roll through town on a regular basis. We have one small one a year type thing. And Steve is that guy that has contacts sort of all over the country and even into North or even into the United States as well. So anybody that has questions about equipment or animals you're going to go to Steve and even if you're new to the hobby you're going to go to Steve for questions so he is that guy he owns and operates Prairie Exotics which is the largest reptile rescue in Manitoba and it is also a traveling reptile education business and also in years past he's played a major role in the annual expos that we had here in Manitoba so in this episode we kind of cover a wide variety of topics of course we discuss rescue just in general the concept of how many animals are in need of surrendering or how many animals are being surrendered Steve is constantly getting packages shipped from right across the country, coast to coast, from animals that are being surrendered. So it was an interesting, you know, ethical conversation around that. Of course, that's something that pops up in the reptile industry quite often. We discuss expos, what it takes to put on an expo. Of course, as consumers, we just go to the expo and we don't really think about what it takes to put on. So that was interesting. And one of the other really interesting things that we talked about as well is the native herpetofauna that is found here in Manitoba. So I've said many times on the podcast in the past, we kind of have sort of bizarre weather systems here in Manitoba. So I go through some of those stats just to give you guys paint a better picture of the climate we have. And then we talk about some of the amazing reptile amphibian species that still manage to hunker down and handle these kind of crazy conditions that we have. And of course, we discuss Narciss snake pits. And for those of you that don't know, Narciss snake pits is an area or a garter snake breeding area in the province. And it is the largest gathering of snakes anywhere on the planet. So Steve talks about that. And of course, I've never been. So I'm definitely gonna have to go there next year with Steve. So anyway, let's jump right into this conversation. And I'll talk to you once we're done. Enjoy. Yes. And it is perfect. Perfect. Well, Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you for having me. As you know, you are the first guest in person that I've had, which is uh, exciting. Love your studio. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you are kind of the reptile guy in our community. I feel like you're the guy that gets all the phone calls. You're heavily involved in the community in many things or many different ways. And I feel like a few weeks ago, we had a ball python on the loose and you must have got some phone calls about <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. What, what did, did people ask if you could, if it was dangerous or if you were going to find it or, or what? It was mainly the news media is reaching out, obviously. Um, and yeah, I just played it's a common constrictor pet that <laughs> yeah. most people have. Nothing to be worried about. If someone finds it and they're comfortable, grab it, throw in a pillowcase or a box and call animal services or myself. Yeah. Um, but if not, then to try and stay near it and call someone who is like 311 <laughs> and they'll get <laughs> yeah. someone there because um, as we're getting colder, especially like today, look at how fast we dropped in just this week alone. It's like six degrees or eight degrees this morning. Yeah, that ball python is going to be struggling outside. Mm-hmm. Um, so we want to get it captured as soon as possible. But there were a couple of people we organized through the Manitoba Herp group and the Manitoba Reptiles group to get some people out there to look. Uh, but the area it was in was near, I think, a pond. There's a bunch of houses, yes. long grass, tunnels. Not the easiest place to find it. So. No. So it was never seen again, I'm sure. 
Not it's that right. I've heard of. No, not that yeah. I've reported. I haven't seen it show up on the Animal Surface's website for an adoption yet. So it's still out there, and it's too bad. I was actually right in that area too. The day before I saw the art- article, oh, really? I was working out at the university. I'm like, oh, I was just driving past there, and of course, you would never find it. Now. No, and it was so funny seeing some of the comments uh, I saw on CBC. Someone's like, "This is a dangerous constrictor. Like your cats Ugh. and your kids are at risk here." <laughs> it just goes to show how much the average person knows yeah. about reptiles. Little. No, nothing. They'll say the same thing about a garter snake. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even think, looking from the pictures, that the ball python was even like a full size adult. It, it looked looks like small. a couple year old juvenile. Like, not a baby, but juvie. Like three feet, something yeah, like that. Yeah. That. So, not a dangerous guy. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> so, let's rewind the clock and get back to what got you into this hobby. So, For how sure. did you find yourself in the reptile hobby? Well, I've always been interested in animals in general and had an affection for uh, reptiles. I went to the garter snake dens and narcissus with my grandma younger. Um, I grew up near Baudry Park on the mm. Assiniboine River there. So we go walk the trails and find garters and frogs, turtles, all that kind of fun stuff. So that was always there. But then fast forward, um, early 20s, I was working at Microsoft, living downtown apartment. I had a cat, which was not supposed to technically be there in the apartment. <laughs> uh, shh. Don't but uh, yeah, I wanted to get a caged animal. And at that time, I didn't really want what I would consider a stupid fish or a bird or mm hamster so i'm like well what else is there maybe a, a reptile that seems cool and growing up as far as pets reptiles any friends i had i mean i think there was a friend with a honduran or nelson milk snake one time and uh <clears throat> a big uh red knee tarantula mm. like an original smithy like a big oh, yeah, one yeah. yeah um so that was only my experience but my sister at the time was working at one of the pet lands so i'm like hey um let's go see what they got there and i saw a bearded dragon this little lizard with spikes that ate bugs and i'm mm. like that's pretty badass. I need that. <laughs> That's kind of cool. And so I actually made the proper choice. I did not buy it then. I went home, did all my research, which I'll admit was probably not all the appropriate research and everything <laughs> I needed to know. But I went back a couple days later and uh, even with a nice discount from my sister, still spent entirely too much money. Yeah. I think the bearded dragon alone was like two two fifty, oh, yeah. which we know we wouldn't do these days. Oh yeah. Um, well, the classic like pet land prices. Yeah. You're like, where'd you get those prices yeah. from? <laughs> but they're gonna drop it down fifty dollars if you're a pet land member. That's so. right. Um and then yeah, the full exoterra sand that dyed its skin in proper lights and heat and hides that it didn't fit in. So like so the yeah, full checklist. Twelve hundred dollars <laughs> and a whole bunch of stuff I didn't need later. But uh yeah I fell in love with the little lizard. Um but then come fall, I made this same mistake many other people made once I knew it was a female. I'm like, well, I need to get her a boyfriend. Classic. Yeah. So found a boy on Kijiji and then watched them dance and have fun. And <laughs> then I think that was coming into the fall. So then it was the first expo. And I ended up picking up a baby crested gecko and a baby frilled dragon. Oh, wow. A frilled dragon at our expo. Yeah. That's a pretty rare find here. It was, especially for back then. That would have been 2009. Yeah. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. And it wouldn't have even been expensive because I wouldn't have been able to afford expensive back then. Because now yeah. frilled dragon babies, especially if they're like CB or Australian, are going for six hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. So that would have been like between the two and three hundred dollar marks, probably all I would have spent then. Yeah. Um. So got them home, set them up, and I think then I got a ball python. Then a corn showed up, and then some leopard geckos, and just down that slippery slope yes, of the way we starting all do it. to stack reptiles <laughs> and spending too much time on YouTube and. Yep. Here we are. <laughs> so that's actually pretty interesting. So you got into the hobby in 09. So mm-hmm. that's actually not that long, no. considering like how much involved you are in the community and how many animals you have now. So yeah. <laughs> how did you go from hobby to, was it Prairie Exotics, the first business venture that you did? Yep. And then, so what was that journey? Well, I've always, I've been an entrepreneur and into businesses on the side, doing off-roading, tech support, sort of all sorts of different things. So I'm always looking for opportunities. And like anyone who gets into keeping more than one reptile, especially if you start breeding, you want to make it a business to help yes. cut some costs, hopefully, because <laughs> if you're the, realistic, the idea. yeah, because if you're realistic <laughs> about it, you're not making money. <laughs> yeah. It's just what you say to your wife <laughs> or your girlfriend. Exactly. Like, it's trying to break even. <laughs> yeah. So no, it's more so for tax breaks <laughs> yeah. and uh, cutting some costs that way. Um, so yeah, the, the focus was at start to start breeding. I bred bearded dragons. Then I did cresties, did gargs, did leopards, did corns, ball pythons. I've done pretty much everything. But um, at that time, I built a relationship with Winnipeg Reptiles. They were one of the only stores at the time who had any decent supplies. So I was getting my crickets and everything from them. And uh, one day, once I had a couple different animals, they're like, hey, we had someone ask if you want to do a or if we would do a birthday or a school or some sort of presentation and um, anyone that's met them, they're not super people 
persons, um, <laughs> especially when it comes to children. So that's not really their forte. Um, so I said, hey, you know what? I, I think I can do that. I've grown up with a lot of younger cousins and stuff like that. So I've always had to entertain and take care of them. So I'm like, I like animals. I can deal with kids see what happens yeah and so started doing that i was still working at microsoft so i'd skip the idea of work uh, a sick day to go to oh, a yes. daycare Classic. school uh did some birthdays on the weekends and evenings and then uh, my position was actually outsourced to india and no longer required oh wow and uh instead of just going on to ei or going back into tech because i'd already done the local circuit like rogers shaw mts all that i've been everywhere and i didn't want to get into the corporate side of things because right. i'm not a corporate monkey so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i didn't want to do that so I figured, you know what? Screw it. Let's uh, let's try this thing. Cause so that was 2009. I got the first reptile, and by 2010, I started the business, and I lost my job. And I think it was 2012. Mm. So it only been into about a year and a half of starting. Right. Wow. And uh, yeah, I sold everything I didn't have nailed down, and moved in with my parents, and just made Working it a there. go. Wow. Yeah. So the first, so after the breeding, the first kind of you, you started doing birthday parties and that yeah. was kind of how prairie exotic started to evolve yeah honestly the first thing i started because i saw there was a need for feeders in winnipeg locally right because everything's yes. coming in from out of province and in mm. some cases like crickets come from armstrong or wherever yeah, in the states yeah. so in winnipeg with our <laughs> lovely forecast and weather <laughs> often they cook in the summer or they freeze in the winter before they even get to winnipeg right so we often have cricket crisis where people can't feed their animals here so i'm like well if i can breed them locally that would be awesome yes so i actually rented the unit next to winnipeg reptiles at the start took the back end of it over and started building a cricket farm and was breeding thousands of crickets but i had a few heater issues where like there's a power surge that killed my thermostat and it oh, no. spiked to, like 300 degrees and killed everything oh, in that room no. set me back a couple months uh, supers all sorts of stuff like that so after a few failed attempts and realizing that dealing with bugs was just complete garbage and disgusting <laughs> and a waste of time yeah. and really not worth my money and effort um it seems so easy but then you think about it it's oh, like no. oh it's horrible I no bet. it's it's completely garbage because yeah, no. they die they probably die so easily exactly yeah they just wipe on and it smells and it's work and the smell and the profit else. really for the amount of work is uh, i like to make more profit for my effort i don't want to bust hours to make five bucks right yes, i'd rather exactly. make 50 dollars in an hour like it just makes sense <laughs> right yes, yeah so that was just a direction that when the education side started picking up and there were more people looking for that, I'm like, I'm going to switch direction and focus on that. And then with the education side, as I started seeing more people and their pets and being known because we did the Shaw TV um, where they right. were having us play on their channel regularly. People saw that just promoting on social media, things like that, going to the parties, going to the Red River X kids fringe kids festival, uh, the children's museum, all places like that people saw. So then you become known as, like you said, the reptile guy. Yes. And yeah. so they're the person they reach out to, whether it's for information to find an animal, to rehome an animal, whatever. And as I started to see that side of it, I'm like, I can't be breeding. Mm hmm. I feel wrong. Like if I'm taking animals in the front door, or let, okay, let's say I'm taking the animals in the back door as rescues, seems wrong to then sell animals at the front door. You're yes, adding to yeah. the problem. Seems counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we stopped that breeding. The only thing I've bred in the last number of years is hedgehogs because I've found that there's a good demand for them. They're not often rehomed, and they have a shorter lifespan, seven years. They're not like the reptiles where yes. ball pythons are forty years, tortoises <laughs> seventy-five to hundred, even my parrots seventy some years. Yes. So yeah. cases like that, people, their focus and priorities, life changes sometimes every week, <laughs> sometimes and, every month, every couple of years. So when you have a long living animal, it really adds to the rescues. Well, that's what I was going to ask about because it's interesting that you kind of started in the breeding side and then now obviously you have, I, I assume the biggest rescue in the province for sure yeah. because you have so many animals and it is it is one of those almost eye-opening moments, right? Where you see, wow, there's actually a lot of animals that don't have homes anymore. Mm -hmm. It's hard to add. And that was originally for me what got me thinking about more of the philosophy of the reptile hobby, which is sort of, what I started, re I, I really wanted to breed some of these guys because I thought that would be really fun. But then mm -hmm. I realized I don't want to take care of 20 little boas. Mm -hmm. I could see them on Kijiji not selling, right? You can mm -hmm. see different litters on online. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that's the same litter I saw six months ago. Yep. It would make no sense for me to add to this market. Mm -hmm. So so you basically just turned off all your breeding and just started accepting, yeah. which is it's almost like you're turning off the part of your business that makes you money and accepting things that will make you lose money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh I said I like to work and make my money, but at the same point, I won't step over my morals for that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to uh, so bring it. So, so that's how the rescue started coming in as well. Exactly. And I mean, we will sometimes get things that come in. We have bearded dragons come in and all of a sudden a week later lay eggs or something like that. Oh, yeah. um, in most cases, honestly, they just become food. Like with tegus, bigger yes, monitors, yeah, lizards. Yeah, yeah. 
if something produces these days, it's often just food. It has to be. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to bother trying to raise them, feed them and find a home and then see them on Kijiji or have them come back. It's, I don't want to add to that problem. No. Well, and that's the, that's the lifespan issue of the reptile hobby. Like mm-hmm. we have these animals that live so long. It's not like you said, the seven year hamster, seven year hedgehog. You have these things are going to live 40, 40, 50 years in some cases. And it always feels weird when you see a kid walk out with a ball python, you wonder 40 years from now, where's that ball python going to be? I don't have any problem with him buying a baby ball python. Mm-hmm. I think that's great, but a lot of times it doesn't. Is make it going to make it? Yeah. yeah. So that's the end of the ball python market scares me so much. <clears throat> Pardon me, scares me so much right now because it's not people just producing one or two clutches a year. People are producing hundreds, in yes. some cases, clutches a year. Mm-hmm. And each clutch can have many snakes. Yes. So we're producing, in some cases, thousands of snakes. There's not a demand for it. Even if you sell those snakes, what happens after within 40 years? We're, we're flooding a market that's going to bottom out in the next number of years, unfortunately. I feel. Yes. Yeah. Well, I definitely, I mean, and you would see it the most because you have the, the rescue. So how does, <laughs> how, how often do you get rescues coming in? Is it, <laughs> whenever um, I ask people on the show with this question, that who do rescues? That's the kind of response they get. <laughs> I get it's like a, it comes in waves. Like sometimes it'll be quiet for a week or two, or, or maybe I'll get lucky and it's a month. Wow. But often it's every couple of days. Like just last week, I took in three ball pythons from Wrangler Lisa in Saskatchewan because mm. they're illegal in Saskatchewan. So right. it's harder for you to rehome. You have to be out of province. So it's a lot easier for me here to rehome larger yeah. population plus being legal. So I brought those three in. And then just today, I had a lady contact me. She's got two ball pythons. She just moved to a new apartment and found out she can't have them there. I don't know why she found out after she moved she can't <sighs> have her. Snakes, but um, she now needs to rehome them with full enclosures, blah, 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 wants to find them and go home. And that's the other problem was if someone has a turtle or a gecko, it's often just one of those animals, maybe two that they're surrendering. With these people getting into these ball pythons, they, have they buy bunch. five or six, they breathe, and life changes, they need to reach home five, six, ten. And I've had that happen. I actually had someone that purchased or adopted. I think they were purchased. They were from someone else, same situation. But uh, regardless, they bought them and within a year and a half, they contacted me to take them all back. Oh, that's brutal. <laughs> and now you, ha- and it's funny, I, I've had people say, you know, that are part of rescues, you, you have people that come and say, hey, I want to donate these animals to your things. Like you're not really donating them. It's more now I have to pay the bills yeah. and I have to find. Now, luckily you, you are somewhat successful finding homes. Like there's lots mm-hmm. of people that do want reptiles, but how many do you have kind of at one time? Luckily, going into this, well, I moved in September, like I said, to St. Genevieve. So Mm -hmm. being ready to sell my previous home, I had to make it not look and smell as much like a zoo. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I did rent a mobile office trailer that I put some of the animals outside. And then we had some in the insulated heated garage and the basement. Uh, But I reduced a lot of numbers, sending some animals to different friends, zoos, facilities, and just adopting ones out to the general public just to make it easier for that move and transition. So right now we're under 100 animals. I think I've got about 10 that are available for adoption. So that's not bad. Yeah. Uh, but at peak, when we were getting ready to shut down our zoo there on Dublin, right next to Winnipeg Reptiles, um, I was over 100, no, sorry, over 450 animals, about 160 different species. Wow. Like, and that's the thing. Like, there's people who have 100 ball pythons. That's pretty easy and routine to take care of. But yes. when you get the diversity of, like, I had aquatic, large monitor, lizards, snakes, venomous, yeah. amphibians, arachnids, but then also the furry. Like, we had hedgehog, chinchilla, rats, dagoos, bunnies, and birds, guinea too. pigs, birds, now all the different parrots. And that's the other thing is, like I'm not just taking in animals in Winnipeg or Manitoba. I've taken in stuff from coast to coast. Like our yeah, I was going to ask you, why is that? How, how is that even? Like, why isn't there rescues? Because I see you always get shipments from across the country. And it's like here's a box of rescues. Why don't those communities absorb those animals? Often there's not a rescue that can, oh, okay. not able to handle them uh, because of either bylaws or different rules. Like we had an alligator snapping turtle that came out of Vancouver. Mm. Um, the person had it there illegally and they couldn't just turn it into a rescue because if they're checked, it would probably be euthanized. Right. So they need to get it out of province. Mm. And again, being Manitoba, we have no restrictions in Manitoba and in Hashi municipality where I live, I have no restrictions either. So right. I'm in a kind of a sweet spot in the center of Canada where and I can have knows. everything. Yeah. And the same thing, like I just got that anaconda and carpet python from Newfoundland. Yes. And yeah. Newfoundland land is essentially an island small population and uh, the person i got it from actually imported it uh in 2015 mm. sold it with i think there's six of them uh this one ended up bouncing through a number of homes and ended up in a drug home where it was locked living in a bathroom with a blood python in a bathroom yeah like just no heat no lights just a bathroom just oh chilling God. in there so uh <laughs> she went in to rescue it she rehabilitated well 
worked on rehabilitating is still a bit of a spastic. Yeah, it's I a saw it yeah, was biting you a little bit in that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a yellow anaconda. Yeah. Uh, so she's got some kids in the home too as she's progressing with her life. So she just felt it was best for it not to be there anymore. Yeah. She didn't want to go into someone in the general hobby in their community because the older people are getting out of it. The newer people don't have the experience. Yes, so yeah. there's nowhere for it to go. And mm. they don't want to euthanize it. So they've found out about us and so we can bring stuff in. But yeah, we had a box come in from Saskatchewan. We had the bird and then the snakes come from Newfoundland. We've had stuff from Victoria. Yeah. Everywhere. <laughs> and that's the other thing with when you have that rescue sort of mentality, the danger, and we were kind of talking about it before we started is accepting everything like so oh, many yeah. people get into that hole where they're just like i think i'm going to start a rescue because i see a problem and then they put themselves underwater which is the worst thing you can do so how do you avoid that horrible horrible well yeah so in a case like someone contacted me with a yellow one and con and they explain the situation i just say yes i can take it i yeah. look at the situation generally someone like the ball python person contacts me they say i want to find a good home can you take it bubble or whatever way they word it i'll say well there's kijiji you can often find a good home or our manitoba reptiles group on facebook yeah try there there's often good keepers who have information and can figure it out if not you're welcome to surrender it to us but we ask for all the enclosure and supplies and a 50 dollars donation per animal mm. before it coming in because we still have to do vet checks check it take care of it and then if it fits into our education it can stay otherwise it'll be adopted out at again of 50 dollars. so if i'm lucky i'll take a hundred dollars on an animal in and out but yes. again i've waived that i've had people there as a gentleman his brother died he needs to get three boas out of a uh, downtown apartment just yeah taken yeah. i just went and took them yeah yeah because i mean at the end of the if you have the snake in your in your possession for a couple of months the hundred dollars goes away right away it's gone yeah but in some cases it's good to get the, at least a little bit of money out yeah of it. one in the case with the snakes i mean i was able to rehome the snakes and i got three pvcs with uh infrared heat in there and everything yeah, so yeah. those are each worth like two three hundred dollars so i mean i'm not yeah, yeah, gonna that, worry that. about that too so, much yeah, so but it's also spies. If I didn't get in there, then either animal services was going to deal with them, which was not good, or the building would have dealt with cleaning out that room. Like, I don't know what would have happened there. Exactly. So. So, and, and in that situation, you kind of just use your yeah. common sense. It's like, it yeah. makes sense. It's not somebody that just went out and impulsively bought them, and a year later, they're like, I don't want them anymore. No, exactly. Try and educate first. Help them find their own home if I can. Just It's easier because they're in the city. If they just find connect with someone, great, I'll try and do that. Just make the sale. But then, yeah. if necessary, I'll step in wherever I need to. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's a it's a kind of the dark side of the reptile world, and I don't know if if other, I mean, I guess maybe you have more of a feel of the other animal hobbies in general. Do they have the same sort of rescue issue? Is that kind of a ubiquitous mm -hmm. across all animal? It is. Hey? Yeah, cats, dogs, small animals, birds. People want cool things and they get tired of them. Right. Um, one of the common stories I use is with my tortoise. I've got a little, uh, I call her Francine the machine. She's a Herman's tortoise. Mm -hmm. So a bit bigger than a Big Mac sandwich. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there was a boy, he had his 13th birthday. He wanted to get a pet. They said, no, you need to prove to us you can get your pet. So he does his research for his whole year, does a presentation, proves to mom and dad he's ready for his pet. So for his yeah. 14th birthday, he gets cute little Francine the machine. Mm -hmm. Takes care of her, loves her, plays with her every day for four years. Fast forward, he's now graduating from high school. Classic. He's got to get a job. He's got to pay for his new car he's got. He's hanging out with his girlfriend, playing with his friends. He's not at home taking care of the tortoise. Yeah. Mom's like, you're neglecting it. What do we need to do? Oh, well, you need to find it at home. Or in some cases, maybe the kid has to go to university, can't take it with him, or he's going out of province. Whatever. So now mom's got this tortoise. She's got all her mom duties. Other kids work doesn't want to deal with the tortoise. So she also loves it because it was her kid's pet. So she wants to get a good home. So that's where they contact me because they don't want to just give it to anyone where it's going to yes. be neglected or end up on Facebook or Kijiji or being sold right away. Yeah, yeah. So they want to go to a good home and they see that we're educated in the public so that it'll come to us. But that story happens all too often yes, because kids yeah. at 14, 15 want to get their first pet. Reptiles are becoming very popular because they're easy to cage, less maintenance typically than most yep. small animals and birds and fish and stuff like that, plus the interactiveness. So we're seeing in North America, like reptiles are going out. also because of the allergies, right? They're hypoallergenic. Yes, yeah. So for kids with, who can't have fuzzy furry animals, feathers, reptiles are huge. But kids focus aside from just growing up changes so quickly. Actually, that's one of the reasons we've offered a, a crested gecko rental program. Oh, really? Yeah. So tell me about that. Uh, it was actually geared for uh, schools and daycares so that they can oh, just cool. have it come in for however X many a months that they want. Uh, so if it was for school from September till the spring, yeah, they don't yeah. have to worry about housing or having a kid kill it over the summer or a teacher worry <laughs> yes. about it. Yeah. Uh, so we just charge month by month. When I come in and bring it, it gets the enclosure, full setup, food, spray bottle, everything. And I do a presentation on how to take care of it. Oh, that's um, awesome. They can choose from an adult or a baby and then have it for X amount and then um, return it. Um, and then we've even had like, we had some parents like, oh, that sounds great. Can we try that? I'm like, you know what? Sure. And some have just rented it and returned it. And they're like, cool, that was a great experience. We'll maybe see when he's a little older. Or 
you know what, this is working out really great. Can we buy it? So it's a rent to oh, own, wow. yeah, uh, yeah. but there's always that ability for it to come back. So it's not yes. just going to end up gone. Huh, that's a really interesting idea. And the reason I did that is I would love to do ball pythons because I've got a butt ton of ball pythons. If I could <laughs> yeah. get ball python for you and yeah. you, ball pythons <laughs> for everyone. Yeah, the Oprah ball python. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, if a ball python gets loose in a school or a ball python bites a kid, that's going to be in the news, no matter yes. what size yeah. or what it is. Plus, I have to have some sort of heat and then it becomes a liability issue. Yes. Crested yeah. gecko, if it bites anyone, not going to be an issue. If it gets loose, not going to be an issue. No heat, no lights, no bugs, it no works. issue. Yeah. And they're affordable. Yes. Yeah, they are actually a good class. My, I have a friend who's a teacher and he has a, we went to the expo and I picked them yep. out one. And so Perfect. every year I go in and do the little demo with the kids yep. to keep, teach them how to do it. And, and yeah, that, and, but they do have the same issue in the summer. Like, where's this thing going to go? Like the kid who says he's going to be good at with it, but maybe in two weeks forgets about it type thing. So that's actually a really interesting solution. And especially if parents are, they have a kid who wants one, but they're not. And not they know sure their ready. focus is short. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like me yeah. with ADHD. It's like, Ooh, something shiny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, as getting back to that tortoise, I saw the other day that that tortoise was in a little movie yeah maybe um, not even a little movie maybe. hugo or something i can't remember what the name was of it yeah i think it was hugo it was posted to our prairie exotics facebook page but yeah yeah uh, we're part of the animal actors group so whenever they need some exotics that are not cats and dogs we sort of step in and provide that i've done right. a few tv movies we did the sunny side that show from uh like that sketch comedy out of toronto we did them with a red tegu oh cool uh, a couple years so ago. they come here and film and mm-hmm. then okay yeah. interesting yeah on set full like movie production everything i even and had to dress up as a tortoise? butler and oh really well this one i wasn't on they actually had their own animal handler for the tortoise oh, so okay. i just dropped off in the morning she was there at eight in the morning she was there till eight in the evening nice 12 hour shift full shift and yeah they took care of her had a little enclosure they got her moving with lettuce and she was in a couple scenes i was supposed to pick her up around 5 36 so like actually they want to use her for one of the main scenes can you pick her up later i'm like <laughs> why not? hell yeah for sure that sounds awesome do they pay you for that yeah oh that's cool yeah 150 bucks for the day that's not bad i'm not sure what a tortoise normally wants <laughs> Seems no, her expenses aren't very high she's got free <laughs> room and board right now exactly so. yeah so it works out well for her yeah and uh, obviously now with the COVID and everything, the the birthday actually birthday parties seem like they're starting to come back up. I saw you slowly, do one slowly, yeah, mainly it? outside in smaller groups, right? Yeah, but before that, so getting back to kind of the normal when things were normal, that must have been a great part of your oh, day. Huge, yeah, yeah. Like on a good week, like a slow weekend is usually three parties on a weekend. On a good weekend, wow. it's five to six. So, so you just kind of stack them Saturday, Sunday, yeah. Saturday, like if I'm lucky, there'll be the odd Friday night one. And then you get Saturday, try and do like a morning, mid afternoon, late afternoon, maybe an evening. And then same thing with Sunday. Once I leave the house, my animals are packed. It's just my presentations anywhere from a half hour to an hour and then around. drive to the next one, do it, do it and then come back. So easy. And that's for most of the year. That's my bread and butter. Uh, I find the works kind of comes in waves. School has their more there in the new year once their budget starts right. and depending on what their class lessons are. Uh, and then daycares obviously in summer camps is huge through the summer fairs right. through the summer falls my expo season. So not this year, but normally I'd be going to Toronto, Red Deer, Calgary, uh, Edmonton, Saskatoon, hitting all that. Oh, and you set up tables at all those? Or Depending on what I'm them. doing, I yeah. either go or set up a table. I'll sometimes team up with like Tails and Scales, help him at his table, or yeah. find whoever's doing the rescued education, help him at theirs, or whichever right. the Herb Society, or just do my YouTube walking around and schmoozing with people. And yeah, yeah. I've also done um, when people are looking for specific animals, if they can't obviously travel to the yes, expo, yeah, yeah. I'll do videos and then they can see what they want and I pick it up and ship it back, or if they yeah. send me a specific list and things like that. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how young kids react to reptiles because it doesn't, they're almost, they're just insanely fascinated oh, by yeah. them. There's a obsessed i bet bet they just like have millions of questions and oh yeah i pull up the animal and the hands just go up and they're shouting everything (laughs) and i'm like whoa 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 whoa. hands down yeah i've done this a couple times i know what you want to know here's the information (laughs) now you can touch it so yeah exactly yeah it it is good i don't know what happens at some point like for some reason as you age people start really hating reptiles or the i don't know if they're scared of them or what it is but it seems like every kid under the age of 10 is just totally fascinated yeah again it's another thing that comes almost in waves. Like we're not born with the fear. Anytime there's a baby, an infant at any of the parties and I come up with a snake, they go to grab it. And the next thing they do is they pull it up to their mouth. They want to taste it. Like we learn everything by tasting <laughs> yes. it that size. Like yeah. they have no fear. They don't care. But as they grow up and get to two and three and they're coming by my display and mom's like, oh, don't touch that. Yeah. Put your head. Don't, no, oh, that's gross. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, that's okay. They can touch it. But that's where I love when you have the mom comes up and say, oh, I don't like that. But you know, you go touch it. You go switch. They don't want to pass their fear onto that kid. That I love. It. And I've even told them, I'm like, thank you for doing that. Yes. Like, yeah. That is a good parenting skill. Like, it's fine if you don't like this snake or this animal or whatever it is for whatever reason you might have. That's cool. I respect that. If you don't want to get past it. 
but you don't need to pass that to your kid. But then yeah. you're right, if that gets told to them or whatever life changes, often it's an uncle, brother, cousin chasing them with a garter snake, and that's yes. what sets it off a lot too. And that's at that 12 to 14 they stage, They have that right? memory forever, mm-hmm. yeah, and it doesn't go away. Yeah, or a frog or whatever it might be. Yes, yeah, exactly. So as far as you're, you have, you said about 100 animals at home, and are you, is it just you doing taking care of all these? Yeah. So. I've got my girlfriend now who's been in for a couple of months who's helping me. So. Oh, good. She's uh, doing some care. Yeah. That is a full-time job right there. Yeah. I had an, <laughs> I had a wife who's now an ex-wife because she wasn't involved at all. So <laughs> it is kind of hard to yes, have something yeah. that's a huge part of your life, like not just the work, but traveling and on the computer, just everything. And um, I'm not just that many issues, obviously, <laughs> otherwise, but yeah. that was a big part of it. She just wasn't interested in the animals at all. So we split ways. But luckily with my new lady, she's very interested in animals. She's really good. And some of my animals actually now, the parrots love her more than me. So oh, really? it's kind of breaking my heart a little <laughs> bit. I don't know if you saw the video I just posted yesterday of our uh, cockatoo. Yeah, yeah running on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. She came over to give me a kiss, but then ran back to mom and was just a big suck. So <laughs> that's awesome though. That's good that she's helping you yeah. and everything because it's, it is, it, you're right. It, it's kind of, this is such a, it's a passion mm-hmm. being part of this hobby. And it, it is kind of weird if you're with somebody that just ha- would hate it or just disgusted by it. And they, even if they're not necessarily supporting it, it's good that they, you know, uh, but exactly. having someone care for it is, is much better. Well, for, Cause there's no end of poop, especially with the birds. <laughs> yeah. And that was one of the things that I've also enjoyed with the transition of where I'm at now from when I had the zoo. I mean, that was a cool experience. I had a lot of neat animals. And at that time too, I had I think it was five staff and seven to 10 volunteers at a time that were coming in every week to help with chores. So it wasn't just me at that time either taking care of everything. Like we had schedules and it was all gone going, but you're always chasing the poop. You're always chasing the food dish. Mm -hmm. You're always making sure something's clean and filled with water. You're always chasing. There's, you're never on top of it. Yeah. And I just got tired of that. And I wanted to do, I want to do better i'd rather do less better than too much half-assed yes exactly especially when it comes to animals it's one thing if you're collecting cars and your cars are all neglected but if you're collecting animals you can't neglect them exactly and have piles of poo getting built in the corner and no water in their dish and yeah. lights burnt out like they're living creatures they're exactly not, they're not pokemon we just keep little balls <laughs> that, and as i always say the ethical implications only matter because we're dealing with life mm-hmm. if, it, if there was no life here i don't care how many things you create it would be fine if it was baseball cards but yeah. if you're looking for the next morph and you have you know 10 or 12 collateral damage normal ball pythons that you don't need for example like it's at least a conversation we need to talk about we can't just brush over it and just you know get, get rid of these it's they are animals and even if people don't respect them as animals they are mm-hmm. and you can see it like a, a, as you get to know the animals that you have they all have personalities and yep. they're incredibly intelligent they're not just simple sort of dumb animals that a lot of people see them as so there's something oh, to, sure. to, to it's deeper thought is required yeah and some of the reptiles are definitely showing us that intelligence but then you start getting into the birds and it gets scary oh yeah i bet yeah <laughs> how many birds do you have we're at nine right now. Oh my God, it must be loud. So you've got <laughs> two Amazons, a yellow headed and a yellow fronted. They're two different ones, apparently. The cockatoo, two cockatiels, three greys, two of them are boarding right now, mm. and then a military macaw. Oh, wow. So that's a lot of work right there. Yeah. But it's fun. Like you go in and they're all singing and dancing. And Are they all in the same room? They actually have their own house. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So one of the nice things when we bought this property is it had about a 1500 square foot house. That was the main living quarters. And then a just shy of a thousand square foot little house bungalow that was supposed to be torn down from some water damage. It had been uh, water and power disconnected from it already. Yeah. But we looked into the water damage is just surface. So we gutted a bunch of the stuff, hooked up the power of water. And that's been my animal house now for wow. a while. That's awesome. So the plan pre-COVID was to build a full zoo building in the hobby farm and build a facility that people could come into and have large, big displays like yeah, little rays type of yeah. thing. But that's obviously on hold. <laughs> yeah. Is that still a plan year. long-term that you'd yes. love to do? Hopefully for next year. Okay, cool. Yeah. But it's hard to buy fencing, set up buildings when you have limited funds and no income yes. for the first And nobody future. wants to do anything right now. Everybody's stuck inside. and Yeah. And I mean, yeah, you could try and fundraise, but everyone's hurting and everyone's fundraising. I'm probably one of the few and only rescues in Canada who's not begging for money right yeah. now because, again, I've put myself in a position where... It's okay right now. Okay, yeah. But that's the other thing about having a lot of animals, even if you're not even doing a rescue, if you're just a private keeper that oh, yeah. just get, you get stuck into collecting animals, it really does tie you down in a lot of ways. Like you can't travel. Even me, yeah. if, if I go for like two days, I have to plan like a lot. Like how am I, how are these guys going to be? So if you have a whole bunch, it's like you are in your home forever. There's nowhere to go. Well, I mean, yeah, if you got a whole bunch of snakes where as long as you make sure their water's full, heats are on cycles and you've fed them, they can leave for a weekend or a week. It's not big deal. Yes, when yeah. you get into 
the mir- like the mirage of different types of reptiles, amphibians, and then parrots. And obviously, cats and dogs need more of the daily carrots. Yeah. Like, my family was giving me some poop because they're like, oh, you're not coming to Saskatoon for Thanksgiving? I'm like, A, it's Saskatoon, and B, no, I've got animals. <laughs> yeah. I can't skip out two, three days just to go hang out with you guys for some turkey. I mean, yeah. it'll A, I have to then stress about making sure everything's done, or B, having someone there and I'm paying them and it's costing me too, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the stress is the worst when you don't, if you don't have somebody there, if it's just gone for a day or two, it's like every bad thing possible is going wrong in your yeah. mind. Yeah. One of the first times I traveled after having a decent amount of collection going to the expos and stuff it was i was on the phone with the staff and people i had checking in regularly to make sure they could call me and i could call them just to make sure everything was going well because it was very stressful because they become your children and it's a lot of work and i think the first couple times were okay there there have been a few times where i've come back and had a few situations or lost an animal and unfortunately but um not in the last recent year especially with getting smaller like i was in mexico for the this was the first year in probably 10 years actually took a week off of holiday So how did you manage the animal? Did someone come in and, yeah. and look? Oh, that's yeah, good. Yeah, we had a local friend there that do very similar. They take in unwanted pets and do some education. And I trust them with, they've worked with some larger animals and they're not just going to be worrying about getting bits. So, yes, um, yeah. and being close, it was financially and easily doable with the time. So they were able to come in and take care of those guys. So that was kind of nice to actually take a vacation, but I don't know when I'll do that again. Now. Yeah, <laughs> maybe never. Who knows? With, <laughs> with the way COVID is, uh, well, Manitoba is hard enough. I was hoping even just to do a, a quick Alberta tour to go out to the mountains and do some camping and spend some time, but yeah. just the risk of Alberta is worse. And if I am getting bookings here, I don't want to have to worry about doing a two-week quarantine if I go on a trip yes, and come back exactly. and then potentially lose some business I might have made. Like exactly, that just yeah. doesn't you, make sense. You don't want to lose any momentum. No. So the, obviously you're part of doing the expos here as well, or you, mm-hmm. you, had, you had a big role. In, what What is the work? Because I think most of us are hobbyists, so we just go to the expo and we just experience it that way. But as far as the work to prep those things, is it a ridiculous amount of work? Is it okay? Or what is it like? Planning the first one's probably going to be the hardest to figure out location, right. who you're getting for vendors, making sure you got your food, you got your tables, you got mm-hmm. the cash flow, you got people to help you, like just all the basics of getting it up and running. But once you got that sorted, I think maintaining it's good. But then it's advertising is huge. That, that's yeah. got to be the biggest one. Because if you don't get people in through your door, A, you as a promoter are not making money on the event, but B, your vendors aren't going to be selling anything. So they're going to be pissed and they're not making money on their costs. And then they're less likely to come back and keeping vendors happy and having proper vendors it's one of the biggest things because that's what gets the customers in too. So yes, it, yeah. it's a big balancing game. And we've we've struggled with the Manitoba market over the years that we seem to lose two vendors every year for the one we're lucky to gain. Right. And what we're gaining is more ball pythons, crested and leopard geckos. We're not even getting beardies or corns or anything cool. There's no stores to opening up. There's no importers showing up. Yeah. It's just a lot of the basics. And the hobby community people want the bigger stuff and the bi- better different stuff it's not the, the variety basics. you want to see the just variety seeing exactly. different animals and that's where you have to leave <laughs> yeah yes you got to go to a different different yeah. province yeah like i do the toronto which is a crbe or that's the pet huge. expo that's the biggest one yeah um i went before it became the cpe when it was they were separate there was the pet expo and the reptile expo right and the reptile expo was huge but then they amalgamated it and the reptile side kind of got a little smaller pushed off to the back side and the experience i found was a little different because you have people walking around with cats and dogs freaking out because oh these are reptiles oh, well yeah. you're at a pet expo sorry yeah or worse the dog would jump up onto the table knocking delis all over the place oh no like that's terrible not to mention just cat and dog poop and piss all over the place <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, yeah. but but the diversity is, <laughs> is, is awesome yeah like yeah. the the plants the supplies the products the new stuff oh yeah uh and then just the reptiles is awesome and then next to that one i would say probably wcre and red deer right for the west side gets everyone out there is pretty good and then the i wouldn't say smaller but the like calgary edmonton saskatoon i think there's victoria abbotsford those guys as well they have some good ones mm-hmm. yeah it's funny because we are fairly insulated here in, Very. in, in manitoba and i talked to a lot of american people and it's to them it's everything is so easy it's like well, just go to the expo and I'll get whatever animal I want. Like if you want an animal that isn't a ball python, a crested gecko or a leopard gecko, you're going to have to do some work. Like mm-hmm. you got to look for where you're going to find it. You got breeders across the province, you know, you ship animals in. Yeah. Even equipment can be hard to find. It's, mm-hmm. it's not the same as, and hopefully maybe that will slowly change, but maybe we don't have a big enough population. I don't know. No. And that's the thing. I mean, in Toronto, they do, well, not tr- just Toronto, but the greater Toronto area and mm-hmm. Quebec, that whole section there, like talking with Nelson and Tails and Scales, he does... I think including all the ones across Western Canada and his, 21. But there's like 17 in the greater Toronto area alone. Like there's one almost every month. Wow. Or, or more than every month. Because they 
like the CPE is in Mississauga. That's the main big one. Yeah. But then there's one in every little one. All the time. So he rents a big um, truck, transport truck, loads up all his, he's got displays that have all his dry goods that are just packed, ready to go. He just rolls them on, takes the expo, sets up his little mobile store, does a show, then moves to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, That's so different. But that's the thing. This year he's lost all those. And even if Grant starts operating ones later on this year, as a vendor, it's hard to go because you now interact with all these people. People are touching your stuff. Is yes. it worth the hassle? Yeah. What home situation? Do you want to take something home? Like, there's so many factors. I've heard right. from a lot of vendors, even if like Calgary was trying to put on their expo, they got the go from the city. They advertised they were going to do it, but the community said, don't. Yes, that's the thing. Yeah. Don't. We don't want it. We don't want to have us be in the news as. Like, for example, the Hutterite community that just got slammed here in Manitoba because they went to Alberta and they brought back it and now media knows and everyone's looking bad on them. And exactly, you see people yeah. pointing and saying comments as they're walking into the grocery store. Yes, yeah. What's going to happen if all of a sudden the Reptile Expo explodes and now there's COVID coming out of there? Like, we already have enough <laughs> bad press. People don't like the Reptile people to begin with. That's the last thing we need. Don't need to add to that problem. Yeah. And that, that is the interesting thing. It, it would be cool to bring in some variety. And, and and maybe one day that will be the case. But it is tougher because you need people buying the animals to bring the variety in. And mm-hmm. we have a lot of starter animals here. But to get the variety, it's a little bit tricky. But that's where with Reptile Express, it's kind of nice. And yes. Reptile Runner to yeah. be able to ship stuff. You find a quality breeder store pretty much anywhere in Canada. And those guys can have it in a box and to you the next day almost. Yes. So, yeah. Um, or... I use WestJet because it's faster and cheaper. <laughs> is it actually? Oh, heck yeah. Interesting. Uh, Pre-COVID, and depending where it is, um, you could usually get stuff easily within the day. Um, like wow. when I shipped last year, I brought in a Cayman from a mall in Newfoundland, and it left at like 7 in the morning, and I had it by 5 in the afternoon. Wow. Um, That's awesome. But this year with the bird and the anaconda, because their office hours were shorter and there's less flights, um, it couldn't go out at the 6.15 because it'd have to be there at like three in the morning and they weren't open. So I had to go out at the four in the afternoon. It overnighted in Halifax, then went to Toronto and then to Winnipeg. So I had it by like four the next day. Mm. So it's still shorter than if it was FedEx. But the problem with FedEx, which Reptile Run and Reptile Express uses, yeah. is it's nice it's door to door if you're nowhere near an airport, but your animal's in transport a lot yes, longer, yeah, yeah. which I don't personally like if i've had to use reptile runner reptile express i use hub like pick up at the hub yeah, so yeah that's what i'm I not worried too. about it on a truck with some guy who thinks oh, i'll do that at the end of the day and exactly. who knows what happens and who knows it. what's bouncing around in the back and yeah, yeah exactly not my cup of tea plus they're going to be charging two to three hundred dollars in most cases i don't think they charge yeah. less than 150 i think i paid 150 for yeah for shipping yeah so my cayman was 113 from newfoundland really wow um, I shipped two boxes from Nelson and Tails and Scales, and they had three full-size boas, two carpets, a full-size blood, and a bunch of small animals. Two big boxes, $130. Wow, that is insane. And from Toronto, that was, he shipped it like 9, 10 in the morning, and I had it by 3, 4 in the afternoon. Wow, that's So awesome. shorter time, direct airport to airport, and half the cost. So you just have to go pick it up, which yeah. you would do anyway. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and the alligator snapping turtle from Vancouver, Victoria, wherever that one, that was like 95 bucks. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. And that's a pretty heavy animal there. That's a, yeah, it's not full size, but it was no. still decent. So yeah. that's why it is convenient if you are in a rural place or not close airport or you just want that service. Yeah. But I mean, I've got okay. boxes. I know what I'm doing. I can drive to an airport. So it's I'd rather just yeah. you know, save myself the money. What kind of Cayman did you get? It was a spectacled. Was that a, uh, a rescue as well? Or yeah. did you want that? Okay. No, yeah. that was when they, again, contacted me. There was a few places it could go. Um, the mall had encouraged them to find it a new home. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, we took that one in. That's another, you do, I do see people getting Caymans and you, that's one where you wonder like, that, it seems like such a cool animal to have, but you kind of have to extrapolate at least 10 years and see how, how big Caymans get for one. And a lot of times they're not super nice. They need a ton of space. It's like, is, is the one you have a, a little bit rude or? Uh, I've actually rehomed them again with the whole situation of moving and whatnot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pawns, I just had to. But um, when I had her, she was actually fairly decent. Oh, that's good. Um, I have had others that were not. So, again, it depends on the animal, depends on the situation. Nice thing with Cayman, are, they are like monitors. You can train them. They're yes, very yeah, intelligent. Super smart. They can be clicker trained, color trained, sound trained, everything. Like one of the coolest things I've seen was at Little Ray's. Um, oh, I can't remember his name, but one of the big alligators. Um, Little Ray actually went in and talked to him, came out of the water, opened his mouth, he put in food, just behaved. Yeah. And he calls and he says, watch this though. Hey, Sylvan, come in here. And Sylvan, another keeper, walks in and the gator just, and backs into the water. Really? Just didn't like the guy. Interesting. For whatever reason. He's never done anything to him, but just didn't like him. Yeah. So he doesn't work with him, but other animals or other keepers could totally work with him. And it's that intelligence and building up that relationship. And that's my preference is actually large monitors yeah. and the 
caiman crocodiles is, is just the intelligence being able to work with them and train them. Same with the parrots. Yes. If you put the time in, then you get the reward. Yes. Yeah. What about, I think you have a Gila monster as well. Yeah. How, like, that's one of my dreams. Is yeah. that, is it awesome? Yeah. He's a little huffy. Like, I've yeah. seen some videos where they're just puppy dog tame and people yeah. are like, coochie coo, like a bearded dragon. <laughs> I'm like, huh, my guy, like, I, I don't really treat any of my animals other than my birds as like, you know, some people are like beardy moms are like, this is yes, my baby. Yeah, like I'm going to yeah, put yeah. it in a little dress and yeah. <laughs> take it for walks in a cart. Like I'm not like that. These Me are either. animals. They should be in the wild. I treat them like they're in their best situation here. Make it as realistic for them as possible. But yeah. I'm not cuddling with him on the couch watching TV. No. But when I do need to move him or interact with him, yeah, he's totally, he doesn't try to bite. He just gives yeah. me a little hiss. And Was he a rescue as well or? No, that was one that, again, from people annoying me, someone just reached out because the market for something like that is fairly small. Yeah. And they're like, would you be interested? It was an extra male. They had a, what was supposed to be a pair oh, and okay. just didn't need to have two boys. So yes, I yeah. said for sure. And it was actually I picked up from uh, Terry Lachance. He breeds uh, mice and rats out in oh, Toronto. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Terry's Racks, I think yeah, it yeah. is. And uh, he's got a couple of so Oh, cool. Yeah, they're such a cool animal. Just I want to get a beaded eventually. The, oh, the that would be cool. Ones. Yeah, yeah. That would be very cool. Did, I think when you were in Mexico, did you see some of the... Was, no, I did not. Oh, uh, the, no, I did actually see one at the... Because you were at the zoo. or zoo. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That looks like a pretty... Yeah, Karak Zoo. That was was funny. it good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It looked amazing. Yeah, that was that was so neat to see some of the animals. Not exactly in the wild situation. Like I did go with bushwhacking. I unfortunately didn't find any caiman in the bush. Well... It's probably better I didn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the ones they had in their enclosure were like big, open, large closures. Nice they weren't enclosures. Yeah. caged enclosures. Yeah. And like some of them had like 30 to 40 in them. Like it wow. was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I posted the videos on YouTube from there. And we were, actually, I found a rescue that does rescue and education raid in Porter Morales, like outside oh, Cancun. Cool. So he goes up and down the beach. He goes to schools and camps and birthdays and all that kind of stuff yeah. with their local wildlife. And then he gets oh, to do cool. the calls where people find stuff in their yards and he goes pulls gators or crocs i guess came in yeah. stuff out of their yeah, yeah. Uh, pools and whatnot so, oh, or at cool. the resorts awesome well i'll put the videos of the of you guys doing the t zoo tour into the show notes so yeah. you can see because it's pretty cool awesome thanks. um there was something i was going to ask oh yeah yeah as far as our local herptofauna mm -hmm. and are you i don't know if you're classified as something different because you're a business but are you able to keep anything because like legally we're not allowed to own anything native in manitoba i don't right. uh, as far as i know anyway yeah, if a kid grabs a garter snake or has a painted turtle, conservation is really not going to do anything. Right. The intent is more so they don't want people going out harvesting from the wild to sell on Kijiji, make money from it. Yes, so of course. That's yeah. the thing. I, and as well, me, they probably wouldn't want me going catching animals and making money off of them by educating with them. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Are mm -hmm. you able to educate on our local? Uh, I guess you can talk about it, but you can't get, show animals of what we have. No, we've had a few that have come in where people have caught them or they've been injured or whatever. So we take them and in most cases, either give them to Prairie Wildlife or Wildlife Haven Rehabilitation because yeah. they're more licensed to do that as actual rescues through the province. Um, or I, with turtles, like I've gotten a couple of snappers or paint turtles. When I lived in Loretta, I just released them in the Seine River in my backyard. Cause exactly. That's where they're from. That's where they're <laughs> from. Yeah. I took a snapping turtle to Rennie one time and released it out in the white shell. So things like that. But no, um, the only thing I'm trying to get is I do want to get a permit so I can get a Western hog nose. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Cause the education side and it's local and they're just so damn cool. I've had them before, but it's one of those things I'd rather err on the side of caution, do it properly than risk negative yeah. feedback it, it, yeah it is too bad that we can't because they're such a great little snake and yeah. they're such a good st starter snake for people too yeah. but we can't own them because i guess they are have you ever seen a wild yeah. well you have hey i had the pleasure of catching one three years ago coming back from the wcre wow. uh, we were herping along the way like we did the dunes we didn't find any rattlesnakes or uh, any gophers sadly are there rattlesnakes in manitoba like no, not they're in you're, saskatchewan okay, yeah, yeah just in yeah, yeah but we were in uh oh just outside medicine hat there's red red hat or red something medicine hat yeah, just outside Medicine yeah, yeah. in Alberta. There's rattlers. Yes, and I knew that, yeah. And they've got the gophers as well. And I found, I just found out about it like a couple months before that we have a scorpion in Canada. Oh, really? I had no idea. Yeah, a boreal scorpion. It's what? a little guy. It almost looks like the Arizona, it's like the Arizona uh, fuzzy scorpion. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's super tiny. We were just flipping rocks and I found it. Like it would sit on your pinky. But I, wow. I thought scorpions were tropical. I wouldn't have thought we would have one yeah. in Alberta, Canada. Weird. But... Yeah, so the, anyway, back to the hognose, we were harping back and we stopped in Sandylands and we're walking and I see this thing squiggled down the trail in front of me and the Steve Irwin in me is like, gotta run and jump and grab it right away. Yeah. But as I'm doing that, I'm processing, I'm like, what am I grabbing? Yeah, yeah. what is that? <laughs> what yeah. am I grabbing? And everything I've seen as far as West Hot, Western hognose and the like pet trade is all bright colors because everyone's breeding for morphs. Right. And this was like the dullest brown little ugly thing ever. <laughs> and it wasn't full size, it was 
not even a foot, maybe it's a little guy. middle finger size dish. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, went and grabbed him and right away turned upside down, stuck out the tongue and showed me his <laughs> belly. And I'm like, oh, frick yeah, look yeah, what he's awesome. doing. Yeah. This is the best thing ever. Like, And so yeah, didn't find any of the uh, prairie skinks, unfortunately. Have you ever, ever seen that? That is the only Manitoba herp I have not found so yet. So you've seen everything yeah. else? Because there's, yeah. I've, I've barely, I've, I should never really gone herping. I should really do it. Maybe I'll go with you one <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, we'll have to plan a trip. Because uh, I, uh, I mean, of course, you see the garter snakes. And, yeah. But there's, I've never seen, we have rough green snakes. Have you seen, mm. I've never Narciss. seen that. Yeah, oh, you find find Narciss. Narciss too? Yeah. Wow. And, there's the green, uh, rough greens, the plains and red-sided garters, which yeah. are again found there. We've got the northern red belly. Um, that can be found up there. And we even have, I found one on my property at St. Genevieve. Oh, really? Wow. The, the, most people think they're a worm because they're yay long, like six inches and worm thickness. The and they're kind of th- worm colored almost. Brownish black. Until you yeah. turn them over, you see that bright red belly. Right, yeah. So, and then the western hognose, that's all we got for snakes. We got the snapping turtle, the western painted turtle, uh, prairie skink. For frogs, there's like five. We've got the leopard, the bullfrog, yeah. the tree frog. And wood frog. Wood frog. Boreal chorus. Yeah. And then salamander, mud puppy. And I think that's pretty much everything. Yeah. I, I definitely have a lot on my list to see. And I actually, I wrote down some some stats for people for um, just our weather here because we have, like, we kind of <laughs> mentioned it before. And I've mentioned it a few times on the podcast, but it's it's amazing that we have animals that, like reptiles that live in our, in our climate. And the average temperature in Manitoba over the whole year is only 8 degrees Celsius, and that's 46 <laughs> degrees. So that's when you take everything, like our highs, that's yep. our average highs. Yep. And we have 113 days that are below zero. Uh, but then uh, on the other side, we have, we're in the top 10 cities in Winnipeg that have days over 30 degrees Celsius, yeah. so over 86 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. So we literally have temperatures into the 35s in the summer and then down to the minus 35s in yeah. the winter. We're the extremes. Yeah. And we have, and there are still reptiles that just hunker down. I joke about that with the kids, like when we get to the part of talking about the Western hognose and that we actually have a skink, a lizard in Mantle, a place that's almost frozen eight months out of the year. Like, yeah. come on, like that's amazing to think. It's crazy. Yeah. I guess the skinks, they must burrow down and they just, yeah. they hide out. And of course the turtles just go to the bottom and just spend the winter underwater. Do you know how they breathe? To their butt. Thank you. That's one of my favorite parts with the kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they laugh at that one. <laughs> I bet they just. I'm like, so they're under the water. How do you think they breathe? Well, they could take the water out of or the air or the water. I'm like, well, yeah, but how, how do they they do that? Well, I don't know. Like, they <laughs> breathe through their butt. <laughs> they, oh, they all shit I bet they love that. Yeah, yeah. it's great. It is a, um, just a bizarre fact. Like you yeah. just, and that's a big chunk of the year. Like 113 days, yeah. they're going to be down there breathing through their butt. Yep. <laughs> now my question is, what happens if they fart while they're doing? <laughs> Just one way, one way street, I guess. I guess. So. Yeah, I actually the other day I was in the white shell and I was driving. I, if you've obviously been familiar with the white shell, but people listening aren't. It's to get through this provincial park. It's a very narrow <laughs> road. A, it's sort of a pretty bad a paved road with really no shoulder at all. It just like immediately goes into either ditch or lake or marsh or something. Or big stuck rock. <laughs> Your giant Canadian shield, just yep. big rock. Yeah, so I was just cruising through there, coming back to the city, and right in the middle of the road is a, a painted turtle just basking. Oh. I'm like, I can't, I can't <laughs> not just pick it up. So I like drove to the side and then my car's like on like a 45 degree angle, like in the shoulder, not like the shoulder, which yeah. is just grass and grabbed him and, and brought him to there. Definitely sketchy. And, uh, oh yeah. But I was like, I feel, I feel terrible just drive Cause someone's going to crank it. Mm-hmm. Like it's, uh, I guess they just hang it on the road to bask, but yeah. it's, uh, well, and they'll like to lay their, depending on the time of the year, they'll mm-hmm. often lay their eggs on the side of the river in the gravel. So, oh, really? or on the side of the road, sorry. Like in the shoulder yeah, area? Yeah, the shoulder gravel. Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. The worst place. Yeah, that's the worst place possible. <laughs> and it's like it's like looking around, there's like beautiful scenery, there's nice marsh, and like you're right in the middle of the road. Yeah. Like and you could have gone to these cool rocks, but anyway, it was cool to kinda yeah. to save his life and so he didn't turn into Well that's one thing I always enjoy is seeing animals in the wild. It's one thing to keep these animals and take care of them and have them in cages, but like going to Mexico and seeing these animals out in the wild. Like and that's why I want to go to Africa, I want to go to Australia and catch some of these and play with them out in the wild. Uh, yeah, seriously. I, I've been to Costa Rica or Costa Rica and that was really the only place that I've seen some other like tropical you know species and the only boa that I saw was dead on the road unfortunately <laughs> but it's one of those things where when yeah exactly like when you see them in, in the wild you just appreciate it on a totally different level yeah it's pretty cool so the other day you posted a uh, video it was um uh, Philippe de, uh, de Villagio oh, yeah, uh, yeah. he did a speech I think was that Herpticon or yeah, yeah, yeah about mixed ver- uh, doing mixed varium have you ever played around with doing mixed species in a yeah you have yeah 
this is one of those topics that for one very touchy you're bringing in cohab which is already like a red you know people red card and then if you yeah. mix the species oh yeah but it's 100 percent possible i know people that oh, do it sure. all the time i have a, a, a group of friends in england that do outdoor cages so they have large cages and they mm-hmm. do mixed species all the time and no one really cares They're like oh that's totally fine yeah but uh tell me about what you've done Ideally, you want to first look at the species you're choosing to yes, use. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Make sure they're not going to try and eat each other. <laughs> um, and then the type of enclosure. Um, often when I've set them up, I want to try and find something that's going to be, if it's a taller enclosure, something a boreal in the top, something mm-hmm. on the ground, and then maybe a water or a, a underground section. So while it's one enclosure, they're utilizing different areas of right. that enclosure, um, adding multiple basking spots, multiple mm-hmm. hiding spots, extra of everything. If you're putting multiple animals and different species of animals, you're not putting them in a friggin' five gallon tank. Yeah, exactly. And if the requirement for one of those species is X amount and you're adding two or three, you're not just doing two or three X's, you're doing four or five X's. You right. have to increase it, not just exponentially by the number of animals, but to, to allow for extra space so they can run and friggin' hide if yes, they need territory, to. all that. Um, don't, I've done a few little ones here, either temporarily or just out of necessity even sometimes. But yeah, yeah. Um, the best one that I ran the longest at my zoo was uh, Crested Gecko, Gargoyle Gecko, and Chihuahua Geckos. So I had a trio, a male and two female Chihuahuas. There was, I think, two males and like four or five Crested Geckos, and then one yeah. male and two Gargoyles. And it was the biggest of the uh, Exoterras, so 18 by... 24 or 36 by 36 yeah the really big one i think that's 30 yeah it's three feet long I yeah think. yeah it's so huge. huge yeah and then i had the full background like one of the rock um realistic rock looking backgrounds that winnipeg reptile sells yeah the universal rock ones that's the one yeah yeah so it gives extra ledges and hides and plus all the universal like magnetic ledges, ledges around yeah. there tons of plants and hiding spots and i had them in there for a year and a half almost and i had no lost tails no bites no damage Everyone seemed fine. No one lost weight. Everyone was happy and healthy. Yeah. Uh, the only issue I had, and again, because I don't breed and I didn't care, was when they were laying eggs in the substrate, anything that managed to hatch out, because I'd find empty eggs. Never really. I think I found one or two oh, babies yeah, that yeah. managed to get it. I just got them as they got out. So, so they became the babies food. became food for someone. But I mean, whether that's the same species or not, that's going to happen often in most cases yeah, anyway. Yeah. But because I wasn't worried about breeding, that wasn't a priority. So Interesting. Yeah. yeah it, it's a really, I mean, with that scenario, I mean, you're talking about New Caledonian deco- geckos. It, mm-hmm. they, they kind of all go together. And it, it's something that I think would be cool to try. You have to be careful about it, obviously. Mm-hmm. But I think it's definitely possible. And I, I recorded a podcast a few, maybe a month ago now with John Courtney Smith from Arcadia. And he was oh, yeah, talking nice. about um, just that social aspect that we don't often think about with reptiles. But in the wild, many reptiles do exist mm-hmm. in groups. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's a part of the enrichment that we should be adding as long as you're doing it in the right way. Especially with collar birds. I mean, look at the garters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanted to talk about narcissists. I've never yeah. been to narcissists, which is another crime. I know. Shame, <laughs> shame, I know. shame. I know. I got to go. I don't know what's wrong with me, oh. but maybe you could talk a little bit about it. I did mention it a little bit on a podcast I recorded with Mallory Lindsay. Okay. Or, or, yeah. Who you, I think you went to oh, narcissists yeah, yeah. with, with Dave Kaufman, yeah, right? Yeah. You went. Yeah. So yeah, that was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. She said that you were great and she showed, uh, you guys, you showed her everything. And so tell us what Narciss is all about. So Narciss is the actual provincial park that they closed off around some, it originally was like a field that a farmer had. And they had some rock crevices in the limestone and they found that there were all these snakes and then they just decided to make it a park and it's just exploded from there to the point that people travel from around the world to come see this because it's the largest gathering of snakes anywhere in the world. Out of I mean, all snakes. It's anywhere. not just garters, all snakes everything. anywhere in the world. And the funny thing about that is, again, going back to, we are frozen yes. like half the year. Yeah. And we have the most snakes. You'd think Australia, like Africa. Nope, Manitoba. Yeah. So tens of thousands of these snakes that hide and hibernate for winter and then come up. Um, so there's four different den sites. Uh, and it ends up being a big walking circle, but you can cut halfway through a field just to get back. They do have washrooms at each sort of the den spots. Um, they have fencing put up around them, so you can't climb into the dens, right. which is obviously good. That's good. And they got yeah. some decks around them over some of the holes, and you'll see the little garters poking up their heads in there. And they're running all over the trails and all over the place. It's pretty neat. But there's yeah, so also some spots outside the park that I know of I could always take and show oh, yeah. you. Where oh, you there's can some get secret spots. Right in there. Oh, really? Yeah, that's where I took Dave and uh, Mallory. So. Oh, that's where you, you took them to the yeah. secret spots. Yeah, nice. so a lot of the shots that they did from the park were there, but any of the shots where it was actually them and garter snakes, that was at a different spot that was uh, oh, it's cool. private and sick. 
secret, like kind of secretish. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, BBC was actually filming there. Oh, cool. And uh, the University of Manitoba does a bunch of research there as well. Right. So um, there's not the fencing, it's not the park, so you can get a little closer. But again, you want to leave the snakes there. You're not taking them with you, and just leave looking. them where you find. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's this migration like they, they, you guys went in the spring right yeah right? yeah so the spring That's and the, the fall are the the times to go but the mm-hmm. spring is bigger right when the they're huge. emerging Merging. yeah because yeah. it's dependent on the weather right so depending on how our spring goes right if it's a slow drawn out like warming up nicely spring the they'll, they'll just sort of trickle out and you won't get the big bang if it's really cold and all of a sudden we get some nice hot weather really fast that's where you get them all emerging at that same time but the wow. spring idea is that they're all waking up they're going to look for food and they want to start mating that's where you get the mating balls and then once they've done that then they take off out to the swamps look for more food the ladies have their babies out there and then by september they start to work their way back and it's amazing i wonder how far they travel from narciss do that does anyone know Ooh, yeah it's they've tracked some of them I, if you check out nature north's website i don't know if you've seen them before uh, they've got no excellent information on all of our maps they've got or at, sorry tongue tied <laughs> on all of our reptiles and amphibians they've got uh, what they call the reptile atlas it's right a map and oh yeah yeah all the I mean, maybe i have seen that actually yeah, yeah so yeah. they've got a lot of good information on that site there i see how, yeah i'll have to see how far they go because it's amazing that they even all find their way back and it's just this incredible I would, ridiculous amount of snakes. i'd have to say like 10 15 if not more kilometers like and yeah. in that area out there it's all just swampy field like perfect for frogs tadpoles worms all that stuff that they're going to want to be eaten yeah yeah what a it's what a neat a neat place so that's on my to-do list yeah it's only like well you're on the south side of the city but from the north perimeter there it's hour and 20 minutes ish so So it's it's not not bad bad. at all yeah definitely on my to-do list it's like you said it's incredible that they can cope with the winter and everything it's amazing oh yeah um that's great is there anything else that you we want you wanted to mention before we wrap up we've covered a lot of different things yeah no i think i think we've gone over most of the cool stuff great is there anything that you're working on right now that uh you want to chat about or that you want to point people towards or is there anything that any place online that you can point people towards well definitely all of my resources for social media we've got the instagram mm-hmm. youtube twitter facebook all that stuff under prairie exotics yeah. um but yeah the next project i'm working on now since i'm not going to be traveling for expos is um we have limited options for some resources here in Winnipeg, sadly. Um, I mean, you can ship stuff in from out of province, which is nice, and there are some great stores in other provinces. But in Winnipeg, unless you want to go to one of the main chains, we have sadly limited options. So I want yeah. to do something that's focused mainly on uh, the exotic supplies. I don't want to do a pet store. I don't want to have animals in my store. Um, if I ever get to a brick and mortar, which would sort of be a long-term goal, um, I maybe have some of my education animals on display for people who want to come in and learn about them or just to save me a trip to get animals if I'm in the city doing shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, But my focus would be feeder supplies, like insect live supplies as well, frozen feeders. Um, And then fast moving stuff like gecko food, like Rapashi Pangea products, light bulbs and stuff like that. I don't want to pay for inventory and space to have a bunch of empty enclosures sit on my shelf for a year. Yeah, exactly. Dishes and stuff like that. You can go to PetSmart, you can go to Pet Valley, wherever and get that kind of stuff. I want to focus on stuff that moves, things that move and things that people need because we don't have a lot of options for that. And everything in Manitoba has to be shipped in from out of province. So yes, we can yeah. save that. I actually found um, a farmer here in Manitoba that is growing crickets for the local food, like people food market. Oh, wow. And so they're delivering for like cricket protein for baking and stuff to some local stores and they've been providing me with crickets so um during a cricket crisis now when we can't get them in manitoba at least this is still an option so i'm hoping yeah. to utilize them to provide for other people will as you well. go back to breeding insects no you're just going to bring insects bring in. In. yeah because yeah. no. we, we do have it is tough to get a variety of insects here like you get your crickets mm-hmm. and your mealworms and your supers but to get oh, we, you can get silkies and and hornworms and whatnot mm-hmm. but it's just not as common like you kind of yeah. have to keep your eyes open so it would be and cool i'd like to, to try and variety. get some of the frozen or freeze-dried or whatever they have do be at roaches because sadly in canada yes. we can't have the live one uh, but there are some uh, companies that have come up with a few different options still to give them. Yeah, there's those packages that yeah. are. It's they're not they're not like the terrible ones that you get at Petland that come in like the container yeah. or like the can or whatever. Yeah. They're like actually Legitimate. they still look like yeah. dubia roaches. So they're not going to move obviously because they're dead. <laughs> yeah. So if you've got an animal that's got a high prey drive, it might not work as well, but. Anything that's a larger monitor lizard that should be eating dubia roaches, most of those guys, you wiggle it with the tongue and they're, they're going to go for it anyway. So. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it, like we said, it's we're in a small community, so it'd be cool to bring some some new stuff in. Yeah. And, the only other thing I was thinking about as far as products would be because we lost Best West, or not, sorry, Best West, I keep saying that, but uh, we lost Pet Traders, right. is having a place where people can drop off or donate to use supplies that people yes. want to get used supplies. because. Sometimes people want to do that. And there's enough used fish tanks and things that need to be sold. So, well, and I, I mean, this Exoterra here, I, I bought that in 2007. 
and it looks the same. Like yeah. there's no there's that you don't thing, appreciate. That's the thing. Yeah. Same like, thing with the PVCs. Like people are like, oh, I'll offer you like half of what it's worth. Why? As long as the locks aren't rusted and the hinges are good. It's the same as it was when it was new. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> exactly. I'll knock like 10, 15 bucks off of it. But that's why I don't sell a lot of my PVC or front opening. The only stuff I sell is really top opening things that I don't want to use. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's amazing how long those last for. Yeah. So that would be cool to just kind of share it and uh, do some trade and, and exchange mm -hmm. and whatnot. Well, Steve, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Thank I'm happy to have somebody in person. It's a, looking at a computer screen all the, all through the, the conversation. So thank you very much. I'll make sure I have everything in the show notes for Prairie Exotics. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It's been great. All right. That's it. We did it. We did the whole thing. All right, that brings us to the end of that episode. Steve, thank you so much for jumping on an episode and coming to visit me here at home in my reptile room slash studio. So that was fantastic. I'm absolutely going to take you up on your offer to go herping and I need to go visit Narciss Snake Pit. So we'll have to do that next spring. Listeners, thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you are looking for any more information on it, head to animalsathomenetwork.com and just click on the Animals at Home header and you can find the show notes for this episode. I've included links to Prairie Exotics as well as a few other things that we chatted about in this episode. And of course, as I said, at the beginning the two ways you can best support the show are a sharing the content share it on social media share it with your reptile friends and b head to apple podcasting app and give the show a five star rating thank you very much to our show's sponsor custom reptile habitats.com links are in the show notes as well as the youtube description and of course you can find a bunch of different reptile supplies there and if you do purchase something a small commission does come back to me which of course helps support the show one more time thank you very much to steve and thank you listeners for tuning into the show i will talk to you guys in a couple of weeks